Okay, so before Robert gets up here, I have a couple things that I want to say about him as, you know, just a little background of him. So Robert is married and has three kids, all of which are 21 or older, uh, and I actually got to know two of them because of ACU. Uh, Robert has been the youth and family minister at Sh Southern Hills Church in Abilene, Texas, and he's been doing part-time for a while now of that. Uh, he's also been one of the professors of the youth and fam family ministry department at ACU for the last 12 years. And my connection to him is I had him for four different classes while I was at ACU, and he was actually the first college professor I got to meet because he was my U100 teacher, which pretty much what that meant was he had a group of freshmen and he was in charge of babysitting them for the first semester. Well, they, AC would pitch a little bit there, help, help acclimate us to university life. So that's, that, that's what was said. Me and Casey actually both had him for that class. So that was kind of the first time I got to meet Robert and get to know him. And, you know, th there's been so many things that he's taught me in those classes that we had. And I really respect him and, you know, value his opinion on things. And he's a, he's a great man. He was, I'm sure he was a wonderful minister just because he's gave a lot of wisdom to me. And I know a lot of things that I do now are because of some of the things I've learned in his class. And so as, as I bring him up here, I'm going to say a quick prayer for him, but uh, Robert Oglesby, again, he's going to be the one bringing the, the message to us this morning. So if y'all would, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and I thank you for uh, bringing Robert to us this morning, and I ask that uh, you bless the message he's going to bring, and just ask that you speak through him and uh, help us take away what we need to take away from this. And I thank you so much for... Uh, the six years that I've gotten to know Robert and the time that he's invested in, in me and uh, some of the wisdom he's imparted on me. And I ask that you continue to use him in ministry because I know he truly cares about you and wants to help families also care and learn to harvest that kind of culture in their families. I thank you so much for him and what he's about to say to us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Well, good morning, Sugar Grove. <clears throat> How is everybody doing? I had, uh, I did have the pleasure of teaching Jason and uh, Casey also, but uh, I just want you to know, anything he does that's really positive in youth ministry here, I want you to know I did that. Uh, <clears throat> I'm very pr proud of that. Anything he didn't, doesn't do well or doesn't do well in the future, I just want you to know that Jason either skipped my class that day or was not listening very carefully. Otherwise, he would have been perfect. Uh, but I want you to know that that you have some great folks here, and, and I love all your staff, but I'm going to tell you, you can do a lot worse than these guys, uh, a lot worse than these guys, but I hope you, you know and will value them, uh, encourage them in ministry. It's hard when you start out in ministry. It's even hard after you've been here a while, isn't it, brother? You, you need a little encouragement at times. More, some of your more mature ministers need a little encouragement, too, from time to time. Worship... Leaders need some love as well, I'd say, from time. Family ministers, you know, any, any of your ministers, I hope you'll encourage them uh, in their quest to uh, help you uh, see God more clearly. Now, to, today what I'm trying to uh, get us to think about is, is the impact on the next generation. Although I'm not sure that this next generation is going to make it. Uh, they're not very smart. They don't do some very bright things, such as things like this. Uh, <clears throat> We, we have some kids that just seem to be brain damaged at some level, uh, doing, doing things, putting frogs in their mouth just to shield their eyes from the sun, or uh, some that think this is a good idea to get on a skateboard and, and consider that. And I hear all the mamas in the place going, no, 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 don't, don't even think about that. It's kind of making you nervous, so I'll move you to the next picture. Uh, here, classic example of... Uh, a student going, you know, why would you kiss on a pig? You know, why, why would anyone do that and think that was a good idea? Well, maybe it's because someone in their world, like their mother or father, thinks this is a good idea. <laughs> maybe, they, yeah, maybe their dads do stuff like this. Now, I'm going to warn some of the men, don't be looking at this going, so that's how I'm going to get up there and trim that this afternoon. This is a bad idea. I'm just going to tell you it's a real bad idea. In fact, I'm going to take that picture off because I don't want you trying that uh, at home. Uh, we are impacted by everything uh, that, that uh, is around us, especially previous generations and, and what we watch and what we see them do. And hopefully we're going to teach them along the way it's not a bright idea to kiss on a pig. 
Somewhere along the way, we're going to teach them it's not a good idea to put two ladders up that way because they'll see when the crash occurs, this is not smart and not wise. And, and there were several pictures I could put in your head about previous generations. I, I'm going to talk from personal experience about some things that if you were to look and see uh, some things in my garage, it would explain a little bit about who I am because they are things and objects of my grandparents. They had a profound impact on me. Parents are, are huge, but I'm telling you, grandparents have a great impact as well. My, my grandparents uh, could be summed up by two objects. Uh, my grandmother's object would be the Bible because I remember her reading at night to me the Bible stories. Every time I went to visit my grandmother, she would read those stories. But my grandfather's object would be very different than a Bible. He, uh, he had, in fact, I have his actual uh, object in my garage. And he, he was a, a man, he, he was uh, quit school about eighth grade, but he would tell me once in a while, he said, you know, I got a PhD, PhD, and you only went to eighth grade. Yeah, here, here they are. And he'd go back here and he'd grab these things with big old long wood handles and he'd stick it up and he'd say, yeah, it's a PhD. It's a post hole digger. That's my PhD. And I got one. And his next joke was, and by the way, it's the only PhD I've ever seen actually work for a living. <laughs> He's right. They don't like that when I tell that at ACU very much, but my, my grandfather was right. And he was a man who was a man's man. He worked hard. He, he never worked fast, but he worked all day long. And he would fall asleep in his chair. I can still see it to this day. About 8.30, 8 o'clock, 8.30 my grandmother would be reading the Bible, which was her tool. And she'd be reading a little extra loud. And I was going, what is the deal? Until later in life, I realized my grandfather was not a Christian. My grandmother was, but my grandfather was not. And praise God, my grandfather, at 67 years of age, became a Christian. Was baptized at the church, at the at a little church about 100 yards from his house. Been there all his life, never went, never, you know, never uh, went to a service there until he was 60, about 67 years old, and then obeyed the gospel. Well, both of them tools. And when I see a Bible, I can go right back to that little living room of my grandparents and hear my grandmother reading extremely loudly for some reason because she's trying to get my grandfather's attention, letting the Word of God kind of wash over his soul, so to speak. Well, it finally worked, and I'm thankful for a godly grandmother. And because of her, my family from that generation on has, has worn the name Christian. And I am so thankful for her. <clears throat> but that object, the Bible, it means something to me. And I can, when I can see her hands around that old Bible that she had. And when I see that, those post hole diggers in, in the garage, I, the, the handles are smooth as they can be because my grandfather's hands had calluses up against those and he used those day after day. But I want to talk, to talk to you about another generation, a generation that's coming, a generation that needs to know why you do the things you do. And we're going to use a story from the Old Testament that you've heard before, but uh, if I were to draw you a picture of this first text we would see a big pile of rocks, big stones. And they would be there, and you'd see a lot of children playing around those stones. And those stones would beg a question, and the question is this. Why are these stones here? If you have your Bibles, turn over to Joshua chapter 4. And that's where we'll start today in the text. We're talking about the children of Israel. They've come... This is the second generation, the second generation to come up to the banks of the Jordan River. The first generation had gotten to those banks. They had not passed the test and consequently had worked 40 years walking in the wilderness, wandering around. But this was the generation that was going to come behind. This was the generation that was going to get it right. And it says, So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, and he said to them, Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder to serve as a sign among you. Get this. In the future, when your children ask you, What do these stones mean? You tell them that the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant. These stones are to be a memorial forever. They wouldn't be considered tools, but it was a sign. 
It was a sign to a generation, not only that was currently there, but it was a sign for the generation to come and the one after that to say, this is what happens when you are faithful. When you obey God, when you're courageous, and when you're not afraid, great things happen. And this pile of stones that came from the Jordan River were all stacked up. And the Lord had told Joshua, I want this done. Not done for the people who saw the miracle. He wanted it done for the generation that was coming right behind. And it was there as a continual reminder of what God does when people are willing to share uh, in, the, in the faith story that God has called them to. Now, I'm sure a lot of kids were playing around that and did ask that question, but you, ought, you get a sense that God is saying, I want this next generation to continue to ask us questions. I want this generation to know these important things. And, and as you look at this chapter and the next chapter, as, Mos, as Moses starts talking about this, you'll see the importance of him saying, we have got to teach these kids. We have got to teach the next generation about these things so that they will understand what great things he can do. Now, we know the event, the actual event, is in chapter 3. If we back up just a chapter, you see that, that the, the priests were the ones carrying the ark. They were coming up to the Jordan. And notice what the text says. The text says, When their feet touched the water's edge, the water from up seemed stopped flowing. They've been given instructions. You're going to follow behind the ark. You're going to get the whole nation. You're going to come right behind the ark. But as they're getting closer and closer to that river, it's at flood stage, we know. We know that it was, it was really high. And don't you know that those, those folks who are carrying the ark are going, Don't see anything happening. Start walking slower. We're going to get real wet. I don't see anything going on. They said something's going Are you sure something's going to happen here? And they get closer and closer. And the Lord does not make it happen. The Lord does not go into motion until their toes touch the water. But then, instantly, God starts doing his thing. And it is powerful. Stopping a whole river. Now, it's not quite as good as, as the Red Sea. Now, that was, that was the one they make the movie out of. That one makes sense. But this one was still remarkable because it's still at flood stage. And it's still being told that the priests carried the Ark of the Covenant. They stood on firm and dry ground. It was not a mud bath. It was a miracle. And they walked across it, and the whole nation got to see it. And that was great, but God said, not good enough. Stack up the stones. Stack up the stones and tell them the story of my faithfulness when you're willing to put your toe in the river. you just got to have a toe of faith with God. But he's not going to move until you step in and get that toe wet. Well... That's something that we need to tell these kids about. In fact, the teaching that goes on, you've, you've probably have heard this scripture a bajillion times if you've grown up in the church. Deuteronomy 6, 1 and 2, these are the commandments and decrees. The law of the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess so that what's going to happen? Your children and their children after them may fear the Lord God as long as you live by keeping the decrees and commands I give you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts, but what else? Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and gates. Those are all wonderful teachings and all wonderful things that we think, oh, that's, that's just for each individual home. That is true, but it's bigger than that. This was a national problem. This was a, 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 a move toward the promised land for all of us, just as we do here at Sugar Grove or any other church I attend. We are a family, a much bigger family than just our little nuclear families. And some of you need help. With the teaching, some of you need other folks to speak into your kids' lives like I do with my children. They don't always listen to me. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. I'll, I'll have these young little interns, these guys like Jason, who as college students would come into our youth group, and, and I'd be telling my kids, you know, you shouldn't do this, shouldn't do that. Well, all of a sudden, they don't listen to me, but Jason says it. 
And they come home and say, Dad, I heard the most incredible thing tonight. Jason said to not do this and this and this. And we need to do this and this and this. And it was the same thing I had just told them. And they're going, Jason is so wise. And I'm going, I hate Jason. <laughs> no, I don't though. Because I don't care who says it to them. I, I need my Christian brothers and Christian sisters to sometimes get through the thick skull of my children at times. To say, oh, I got amen on that. I'm so, whew, we're getting dangerous territory here. But I'm blessed when Jason has an impact on my kids. Especially when they're speaking from the, the Word of God and, and saying, you need to think about this. Moses did an incredible job. In Deuteronomy, you got from chapter 6, you just keep ripping through the rest of Deuteronomy until you get to chapter 32, where it talks about the song of Moses. And he is reminding the people over and over and over again. This is what God has done. When we misbehave, this is what happened. But when we were faithful, this happened. And I want you to remember, when you get to the promised land, if you will do these things, things will go well. You're going to have life. You're going to have abundant life. It's going to be wonderful and a fruitful time. And I don't care how big those people are. I don't care how numerous they are. With God on your side, you win. And he said, keep teaching this. And all these lessons, and all those parents who got to wander around those 40 years because of their decision were in their tents every night saying to their own children, we blew it. When we got to the Jordan River, we blew it. Kids, we're not going to get to be there with you. But we want you to not Make the same decision we did. We want you to make a decision for God. Trust Him. And because of that, we have the story in Joshua. That they made the right call. But Moses, as he had instructed the people, he was saying some really powerful things. I, I urge you to read the rest of Deuteronomy. It is a unbelievably affirming Rendition. It, it was like it, it's like a sermon that would not end because Moses knew at the end of the sermon, he he and God were going to go take a walk, and that walk was for Moses' funeral. So that'd be one of those sermons I'd just keep preaching. I'd just keep going. That's why he did chapters and chapters and chapters, going you know. And in my final, well, not my final, my next to final point, because he knew he and the Lord would kind of walk to his cemetery plot. The Lord's going to cover his soul. But he was saying important things. And we need, as Christian parents and grandparents, we need to be saying some really important things, just as Moses did. Some of those things are to our children. Trust God. You may not understand it. Trust Him. I had a, a close friend of our family died in... Uh, my kids were a little bit younger uh, at this time, but we were sitting down after the funeral, and as we sat down after the funeral, I said, you know, this is really tough and it's hard, but I said, I, I want you kids to sit down and listen to me for just a little bit. So they got that, that look in their eye that they're actually listening to me. And I said, someday, it's not going to be our friend up in that casket. Someday it's going to be me. And y'all are going to take me off to a, a cemetery plot. You're going to put that box in the dirt. going to cover it with dirt. And you're going to go back to the church and you're going to eat potato salad. And the minute you put your first bite of potato salad in your mouth, I want you to remember this conversation. And they were like, what is he talking about? Is he taking drugs at this late stage of life? You know, what's dad doing? And I said, here's, here's the deal. When you take the first bite of potato salad, I want you to remember that I said, I'm on the other side of the curtain. I have gone on to my reward. But there is only one thing I want you to remember that day as that potato salad starts going down, and that is, I want you to be there with me someday. 
that is that you take everything else in life, boil it down to one thing. I want you to be there on the other side. And I will be looking for you on the other side. I'm going to be searching for you, and I am not going to be happy until you're over there on that side. So everything you do the rest of your life, I hope, is built toward meeting me. Because I'll be getting the place ready most likely before you get there. Do you understand this, kids? Got it. And someday they are going to put me in a box. And I hope when they get to the church and they eat that potato salad, I hope they'll all go, remember when Dad talked about that? Yeah. Important lesson? Absolutely. I think that Moses did a fantastic job of inspiring a generation to remember what God had done and, and more seriously taught them here are some things to talk about and teach. In fact, there, there were several things in his teaching, I just some theme things that I, I, I want uh, you to know because if he did not teach this from older generation teaching younger generation, which I think is so biblical and we get away from it sometimes, there are, there's a big movement right now that are just gathering up a bunch of young people and starting a church. Well, that's good, except the problem is they don't have that wisdom and maturity. And they need that. If they don't do that, here's what happens. You get a bunch of younger pe young people all together, and there's going to be a mess. There's going to be some problems. They're not going to be quite as good. And, and at some level, somebody who's a little bit older than a two-year-old needed to be in charge. And, and there may be a dad that's, that's in the next room that's about to get a real surprise because his wife's off at the store getting groceries, and he's about to really get, catch it for not paying attention. Well, we as an older generation, we've got to pay attention. And we've got to help them with some of these things because they need the wisdom. And we also need the passion, the energy of the younger generation. It's not one-way street. It's both. We need each other. But here's, here's some of the lessons Moses laid out. When God commands, what does he expect out of us? He says, you obey. But I don't understand it. I don't get it. We're going toward the river. We're going toward the Jordan. It's at flood stage. We cannot cross the Jordan River. And yet God says, trust me. And they put their toe in and great things happen. They're going to cross over the promised land. Not far behind that miracle, they're going to go to a place called Jericho. And the Lord's going to tell them to do something really stupid sounding. Why don't you march around the city? And they marched around the city. And I'm sure they felt foolish, once again, going, ah, nothing's going to happen. Don't, you see how big those stones are on those walls? That ain't going to come down. Well, yes, it did. It came down. Down to every brick. God says, trust me. And Moses said, teach them. Trust in the Lord. No, it doesn't make sense. Culture is going to say, it's got to make sense before you're going to try it or do it. In Christianity, that's not true. So what, what other lessons? When I'm fearful, what does he expect out of us? He's going to say, be courageous. Don't sit back and be fearful. That's one of the things that it seems like we as Christians, we, we kind of run to our buildings, hide in the building, worship together, have a great time, and then run scurrying back out. And we're afraid of the culture. What needs to be happening is the culture ought to be afraid of us that we're about to get out of here. You know what I mean? They ought to be trembling just as the people in Jericho. They heard the people of Israel were coming. They heard the children were coming that way. And it says they were afraid. Why were they afraid? Because they saw God showing up in incredible ways. Because a nation stuck their toe of faith out in the river. And all of a sudden the river parts. And they heard about it. And they went, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then when the people heard about Jericho, everybody started going, hey, these children of Israel, man, they're not, not people to be messed with. Because God was with them. We did a thing a few years, it's probably been about seven or eight years ago, we started a deal called We Are the Sermon Day. It's a novel idea in which we came to church in work clothes, did our communion service, and then we left. We didn't have the preacher preach that day. It's a, good, it's a day off for you. Isn't that great? Day off for the church as well. But... <laughs> But we, we had projects all over the town of Abilene. And we were working with people who are from our church, but also a bunch of people who are not from our church. 
people who had called in the city saying, we need a ramp built for a special needs child. We need uh, paint, paint put on our houses. We need this, need that. And it didn't matter where it was or, or, or who it was. We just said, we want to go out and help people during what we would normally consider our worship time. And we called it, We Are the Sermon. Well, imagine this. Imagine a thousand people spreading out. Instead of being here, we'd be all fanned out all over Houston. And we'd, we'd infiltrate cer certain neighborhoods where we were kind of all together. And all of a sudden, you see ladders, and you see cars, and you see people all over these houses, just like worker bees working on these houses. And as this was going on, everybody up and down the block who has not attended church that morning are going, what's going on? Bunch of Christians out doing stuff for people. Well, what, what's the angle? Are they trying to invite you into their church? Well, they said they, we could come, but they're just helping us. Well, we started doing this over and over and over again. Now we do it two and three times a year. And here's, here are the things that happen. It's things like this. I, we were painting a house for a little lady, and uh, she was not able to do it herself, couldn't afford it herself, and we paid for everything, and we did everything. And within about two days, we transformed her house from uh, something that really didn't look very pretty to something that looked wonderful. And as we brought her out and said, come walk around the house, see if there's anything else we're missing or we left out. We started walking around her home, and as we walked around and turned the corner and we moved to the next, next uh, side of her house, tears started flowing down. And our whole group just kind of following behind going, you know, is she upset with the paint job? Did we not do a very good job on this? And she's just bawling. She's not saying a word. And we finally get to the, back to the front of the house, and she said, it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. And she said, I need to tell you something. I said, what? She said, I've been praying for six months. Somebody would show up and help me. Really? Yes. And she said, the house is lovely. But she says, you know who's great? It's God is great. Because y'all were his hands today. Well, there's not, and we had people from 80 years old down to 8 years old working on this house. It was an intergenerational project, and it was incredible. And there's not one of those people there that day that didn't go, wow. To feel like you have been the hands of God and doing the things he would call us to do. And I asked the question, why is this so powerful? And they said, because this is a little bit out of the box and we're a little fearful, not sure we should do this, but today we feel like we have talked about our religion enough. We got to do it today. So be courageous in those things and those times uh, together. God, God is encouraging us as generations to get, get along together. Now, a lot of the older generation, we don't like these kids questioning things we do. But I'm going to tell you, I feel like this pile of stones that we talked about today actually is God saying, I want to encourage questions. Ask questions about the past. Ask why we do things. Ask how God has been faithful. Ask, ask, ask. We tend to not like the gener younger generation to ask a bunch of questions. They'll say something. Why do you do things the way you've always done things around here? That's just the way we do things. But have you ever thought about changing? Change! We're not going to change no way. We've done it this way for the last 3,000 years. We're not going to change. Well, they, they deserve some answers. They deserve to, to ask some questions. Uh, we, as an older generation, we need to help them with lots and lots of, of uh, questions. There, there's a really great letter that was written by a young lady uh, from Texas A&M. She was a college student at the time, a junior at A&M, and she writes this, this uh, piece about the generations in questioning. She says, I'm a member of the upcoming generation, the one after Generation X that has yet to be given a name. So far, it appears most people are, are liking the idea of calling us Generation Next. I believe I know why. The older generation are hoping we will just assume our place as next in line. You tried for years to buy us happiness, but it's only temporary. Money isn't the answer. It's time for people to begin admitting they haven't answered some very, very important questions. These questions don't represent me, but a whole generation that's struggling to grow up and make sense of this world. 
People may label us Generation Next, but we are more appropriately should be called Generation Y, W-H-Y. She says, here are my questions for this generation. Why did most of you lie when you made the vow of till death do you part? Why does the television do most of the talking at our family meals? Why is work more important than your own family? Why is quality time generally no longer than a five to ten minute conversation every day? Why do you try to make up for the lack of time you spend with us by giving us more and more material objects that we do not need? Why have you neglected to teach us morals and teach us values? Why don't you have enough faith in us to teach us abstinence rather than safe sex? Why do you allow us to watch violent movies but expect us to maintain some type of childlike innocence? Why do you allow us to spend unlimited amounts of time on the internet but still are shocked about our knowledge of how to build bombs? And last of all, why are you so afraid to tell us no sometimes? Those are really great questions. And you know what? They're questions that deserve to be answered. Question is, are you answering those questions at your house? Are you teaching those values at home? If not, I would say they are going to continue to ask the question that now the response is up to you. What are you willing to do about it? I, I think some of these questions may make you feel uncomfortable. They may push you. They may, they may uh, put you up against a wall. But I'm going to tell you, we as an older generation need to, to examine them asking great questions. I think they have valid questions. And we're going to have to be a little more flexible, maybe not quite this flexible uh, in the older generation. <laughs> but it's going to be a little painful at times because we're going to say, how dare you challenge some of our things. But I'm going to tell you, this younger generation, they love God. I'm telling you, they're, they're going to they're gonna push through and they're going to ask great questions and they're going to challenge you and they're also going to do some great things for God. We got kids at ACU doing unbelievable things. We got this one young lady who started a whole uh, movement to, called the Red Thread Movement that is sweeping the country and they're raising money to get girls who have been involved in the sex trade across in Nepal and, and uh, in some of these other countries getting them off and out of prostitution. But they're raising money over here, taking care of the girls, starting school so the girls over there can learn trades so that they can stay out of that type of work. They're actually buying girls back out of prostitution. That's a college girl. Did I, was I thinking about that stuff when I was in college? No. But they are. And they are leading us by example. And some of us are going to have to say, Let's get out of the way. Let's flex ourselves a little bit and invite them back in to a great, great ministry. Uh, what we're ask, also asking them to do and to think about is take a step of faith that shows God's power. We must tell them the stories of the past, but also allow them to build new stories. These, these folks coming up, these kids, the next generation coming up, are going to do some incredible things. They want God to show up in their world. And we don't want to do anything as an old generation to discourage that or quench that spirit, right? We want to encourage them. That means we're going to hug their necks. We're going to allow them to be a part of our churches. I travel enough to hear this little phrase said in churches all across America. Our young people are the church of tomorrow. And I would say that is wrong. They are the church of today. And if we don't start doing a better job of encouraging our young people to be a part of this church right now, they will not be here tomorrow. The reason why they wanted these children to look at those, that pile of stones, they wanted to be a part of a greater mission, a greater story. And though those kids were going to become the storyline, the mission of God across time. We need to do the same thing with our students and our families here at this place. They need to understand God can work through them. If you go back and look at all the characters in the Bible and start asking what age did God call them, you see people like Joseph, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Mary, 
lots and lots of young people that God went, come here. I need you. And you know what? Those young people did some unbelievably great things for him because they were willing to take risk and because they had older folks coming around them saying, we want to help you get there and do something strong and do something courageous. That's the challenge I leave with you today is older generation, let's encourage these young people. Let's get them to do the things that they're supposed to do. Tell the stories. I don't know what stones look like for, for Sugar Grove. I don't know what your moments in your history, but you need to talk about how God showed up. And I hope you have some things that have happened in this church that you've thought, there is no possible way this could happen without God. And you can say to your students and kids, look at this. Look at this. <coughs> Remember when God showed up? And more importantly, I hope you can join together in doing some things uh, very similar to what we talked about up here on these screens of just ministries and things that aren't even, I, they're just ideas right now that may become reality as you join together and start asking the question, when is God showing up? What little toes do we got to stick in some water somewhere to make something great happen for this place, for our kids, and for our families? Let's pray together. As we end today, Father, I just pray that you will be with this church in a very special way, that uh, this has been encouraging to them, and, and hopes, uh, hope, I hope that this will challenge uh, people to, to continue to teach and continue to do the things that you have called them to do in a great way. And Father, uh, help us to continue to point toward you for all the mighty things you have given us and the, all the mighty things that you have done in the past of this church but also the things you're going to do in the future through this church. Help us to continue to look back behind us and have our hand extended to a generation that's coming along to say, come join us in the mission of God. We pray that together as a church. In the name of Jesus, amen. If we can help you in any way today, we would love to pray with you or just share with you uh, any help that uh, you need spiritually. So we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing. All who are thirsty, all who are weak, come to the fountain, dip your heart in the stream of life, let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy. As deep cries out to deep, and we sing, Come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus. All who are weak, come to the fountain, dip your heart in the stream of life, let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy. As deep cries out to deep, and we sing, Come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit.
to say thank you to our brother Robert for being with us this weekend. Great, great brother. We appreciate the word of encouragement. Thank you so much for blessing us and breaking that word of God. And I want to say to all of you, in the name of the Father, I want you to go out this week. I want you to go out in your lives. Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the encouragement that that Spirit brings. Be filled with the confidence. Be filled with the joy. Be filled with the peace of the Holy Spirit of God. And let your life be a channel of blessing to all of those around you. You're dismissed. Go in peace.